Good morning. Hi. Hey, good morning, Ronaldo. Good. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Sorry, I had some trouble getting this set up. Give me one moment. Yes, and that is fine. I completely understand. I was getting, I had some connection problems myself. It's good to have you on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good to have you too. Yes, yes, it's great to have you. Let me begin officially. Good morning. I am Ronaldo McKenzie, and welcome to another episode of the Near Liberal Round podcast. And finally, we have with us Mr. John Anthony Castro, the U.S. 2024 presidential candidate. Good morning, John, and welcome again to the show. And I am so, we are so delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you. How was the weekend for you? A very busy weekend? Oh, no, actually, very relaxing weekend. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That's good. So, who is John Castro? Who is John Anthony Castro? And I actually visited your page and saw that um, you were born in, um, I, I will not try and pronounce that, the, the city. Yeah. What's it called? Well, uh, sorry, Lenstool is what's on my birth certificate, but... Uh, oh, okay, and um, tell me, do you have a... Um, do you speak some German? Uh, very, very, very little, like very rudimentary <laughs> elementary. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. And um, so first of all, tell me, what was life, what was life like growing up in Germany? Uh, very different. Uh, we didn't have television uh, on a regular... Um, and, and yeah, that is something that's very unique about my life. It's the first 10 years of my life was in Germany. Um, Playing from home and, and yeah, whenever we wanted to, like, we had an aunt back home in Mississippi that would record television shows like The Simpsons and Living Color and stuff like that, Saturday Night Live. And then uh, she would put it all in a VHS cassette and then mail it to us in Germany. And then we would watch the same episodes like a thousand times. <laughs> But oh, uh, wow. it, was, it was mostly playing outside at the playground. That, that's actually where I learned German. Um, yes. I didn't find out until much later in my life from my mother and my father that um, I apparently spoke fluent German when I was a child. And they said, you just picked it up on the playground, just playing with all the other German kids. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. But, uh, but I was there because my father was stationed in the military. And so, yes. uh, yeah, first 10 years of my life was out there in Germany. Yes. Okay. That's nice. And um, so the first 10 years of your life and um, so you went to school in Germany and um, any problems in adjusting? When you no, no, I mean, oh, work. when I came back, yes. Yeah, um, yeah the, the customs were a little bit different. Um, you know, everybody over there, at least in the town that we were in, they were very, uh, very, very warm, very friendly, you know, so we would always hug each other, uh, yes. you know, give each other a kiss on the cheek whenever we saw each other. And I remember I, I got in trouble in elementary school when I came back and I did that. <laughs> and they were just oh, like, wow. oh, yeah, you don't do that here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that, was, that was pretty funny. I had to, I had to kind of adjust that. Um, yeah, because, I mean, in Europe, you know, it's just everybody's a little bit more warm. But, uh, yes. but yeah, yeah, it, was, it, it, and it didn't take too long, though. And, you know, I saw that you worked at Pizza Hut. I, was very, I, looked, I did some research. And uh, I, was, I wanted to know more about you. So um, I did some research and I saw that you worked at Pizza Hut for two years. Yeah. Can, while you were in high school. And let me tell you, I have been talking about um, the interview with you with many different people. And there was a, there was a, um, a Stop the Violence March here in Philadelphia over the weekend. And I got an opportunity to meet several hundred people, interview them. And many of the young people had questions for you. Many of them have dreams and one young lady, and, and I'm going to actually play some of the interviews so that you can hear it. One young lady said um, she played and she wants to be a musician and she wants to be a big musician. And she just and she wanted to find out, you know, how they can relate to you because you work in high, you work at Pizza Hut. And then, but here you are. And actually, you know, I wrote a question and I'm going to tell you what I have, the question I have. I, have for you. I said, you know, well, I mean, let me not assume. Uh, your parents, where are your parents from? Were they born here in the U.S.? Yeah, they're, they're American. They're born here in the U.S. They're American. Okay, great. So, and, um, and, but, um, but you have a name, it's Castro. And, you know, I'm Jamaican. I'm from mm -hmm. Jamaica. And many people relate to, to, uh, to, to we are familiar. So when people hear Castro, what comes to mind? And what do you have to <laughs> people about that? I'm sorry, say that, what was the last question? Yeah, the, the, the name Castro evokes a lot of names. Would you have to explain yeah. 
people to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it's funny because yeah, of course that's come up my whole life. Um, yeah. You know, I heard it a lot growing up as a child, and so you know, naturally, when you hear people make that direct reference to another person so yeah. many times, you're going to be curious, right. like who is this person that that shares yeah. my name? Uh, and so uh, I actually did a lot of research. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, on Cuban history, even though I, I, I'm Mexican American, uh, right. you know, uh, I did a lot of research in Cuban history who Fidel Castro was, just because, again, like you, I he would hear it at least once every three to four months from the age of five all the way to like seventeen, you know, all throughout high school yeah. and everything. So, you know, there, there's only so much before a person's going to be like, you know, who is this person and really want to understand, like, why does everybody know his name? <laughs> yes. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a name, you know, uh, I, I look at uh, one thing that made me feel really happy was when Obama got elected, you know, because his name was Barack Hussein Obama. And we had yes, gone yes, to war yes. with Saddam Hussein, you uh -huh. know, in, in Iraq. And I know a lot of people thought like, oh, that's it. You know, his name's too weird. It sounds like Osama and yes. Hussein and, and, you know, sounds like a terrorist and, and a dictator together. But, uh, you know, to me, a name is just a name. You know, it's, it's my family yes. name, uh, you know, at least, at least in my lineage. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but in Texas, there's actually a Castroville. Uh, so a city called Castroville in South uh, San Antonio, and then an actual county named Castro County. Uh, and it roots back to an individual by the name of Henry, Henry Castro, uh, who is actually one of the founders of the state of Texas. They were only the top three people that brought the most settlers to the state of Texas was Sam yeah. Houston. Everybody knows his name. Stephen F. Austin. Everybody knows his name. Uh, and Henry Castro. And yeah. what's funny is that, uh, well, I mean, not funny. I, I think there's some hidden motivation behind it. But it seems that uh, even though Henry Castro brought more settlers to the state of Texas than Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin is obviously more widely known. And I feel like, right. you know, the uh, the contribution of, of the Castro family to the founding of the Republic of Texas is really uh, uh, possibly even intentionally downplayed. But uh, but yeah, the, the name actually has a lot of uh, significance in the state of Texas that I think uh, right. you right. Know, history has uh, suppressed. That's interesting. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I there's on my I do a blog as well. When I started the blog in 2010, and but there's one of the things I've always said, I've often said, and I've written about this. What is the ultimate of all things? Um, the ultimate of all things is that we become one with reality, with all of our individuality. And then I said, a man once said, once you label me, you negate me, and that's what that's Kierkegaard. And um, and I actually was reading something you said, which was quite powerful quite remarkable, which I wanted to ask you about. And um, you said, so you, someone asked you some time ago, what do you believe are the core responsibilities for someone elected to this office? And you responded by saying, to always promote the interest of the nation over any ideology, individual or interest group. And um, that might, and how do you propose to do that? And how does that speak to you? And um, in, we live in a society that is becoming more divided than anything else. And um, how do you propose that we can do that? Yeah, yeah, it's tough, um, <clears throat> especially in this hyper-politicized environment. You know, it's, it's, a, it's very difficult. I'm a very pragmatic person. Um, I, I take a, so I grew up, um, I grew up poor. You know, my family yes. was poor, that, that was our background. Um, you know, uh, I, I became a union organizer. I looked at the system and the way that it was structured, and I felt that there was a lot of, uh, you know, inherent um, limitations and, and barriers put in place. I was able to overcome those, and but I know that I'm the exception, not the norm. Yes. And um, and so I I always told myself, you know, if I'm able to get out of this hole, I'm not just going to, you know, cut and run like everybody else. I want to build a ladder and I want to help others as well. Um, and. I don't know what it is about human nature. A lot of times people just, they're like, hey, I went through it, you can go through it too. And yes. uh, it, I, I believe that perpetuating injustice is, is an injustice in and of itself. And it makes you, uh, you know, a, a passive participant, you know, in, this, in the system. And I don't wanna do that. Uh, I wanna look back at the system and, and figure out how to fix it. As I got a lot older, I started seeing more and more, uh, having more friends that, that were of a diverse political background, uh, conservative Republicans, 
And I started seeing their world perspective and how some of their, their views made sense. I didn't agree with them all, but they made sense. And so I started becoming more well-rounded. And what I eventually realized is what really makes America great is that you get liberal ideas, you get conservative ideas, and you force them all into a building, you know, that we call Congress, and you force them to hash it out. And what comes out of that is the best of both parties. But I think whenever there's one party rule, I, I think you're going to have disastrous consequences, you know, whether it's a far right state like, uh, you know, uh, Alabama, you know, or whether it's a far left state like California, um, you, you're going to see when it's like one party is in power, you're going to have a, a lot of bad outcome because you're, you're not getting a, a well-rounded view of the world and a well-rounded approach to solving problems. And so, you know, there are, there are again, conservative policies that, that I agree with and there are liberal policies that I agree with. Uh, when it comes to, I would say, foreign policy and economics, that's where I'm definitely uh, on the conservative side. When it comes to social issues, I'm definitely more on the liberal side. Okay. And, and see, that's the part that a lot of conservatives are like, wait a minute, then if you agree with a liberal on anything, why are you running as a Republican? Um, and it's just like, look, it's more from a libertarian angle. Yeah. And, and like, there are even things that, that, that very few things that I agree with with libertarians. Um, but most importantly is the Fourth Amendment. I don't like government intrusion in any yeah. sense. And so when I see, you know, conservatives being misled into being obsessed with the lives of LGBTQ uh, individuals, to me, it's just like, leave them alone. You know what I mean? Like, like who cares? And then, especially on the issue of, of abortion, um, they always ask me, are you pro-life or pro-choice? And I say, I'm pro, I support the right to choose life. Yeah. And it's not that I'm trying to be a politician and like trying to play both sides. What I'm trying to say here is that it has to do again with personal liberty, individual yes. liberty, individual responsibility. You know, you, yes. you make those choices. And, uh, you know, e even me as, a, as, you know, having grown up as with a really strong Christian background, you know, it, to me, it's like, hey, we're not a theocracy. You know, I, yes. I don't want to impose my beliefs on other people. I, I think it's incumbent upon Christians to go out there and win the hearts and minds of people, get yes. them to choose life. Um, right. Don't try to do it through government mandate. You know, that's, yes. that's not what what Christendom or, or, you know, is, is supposed to be about, you know? So, you know, it, it's things like that. You know, I, I take a very, again, a very pragmatic approach to, to everything. Um, I approach each issue uh, just based on the facts and the data, you know, yeah. and whatever works uh, is, is going to work. And it's funny because, you know, even though I get labeled a rhino as a result of that, you know, rhino <laughs> being uh, Republican in name only, uh, yes. A lot of people don't seem to realize that's exactly what Reagan was. Reagan, right. in my a lot of my beliefs, except with economics, because I think he was horrible with economics. But <laughs> a, lot <of> his, <laughs> a lot of a lot of his beliefs and mine are we're about like ninety nine percent aligned on all the political stuff, except on some of the economics, like trickle down economics. You know, it was a good theory at that time. They tested it out, turned out to not be good. That's the only thing that I think Reagan and I would really divert on. But there was, a lot of people don't know the earned income tax credit, which people have labeled the, the most socialist uh, tax policy that grabs wealth from the upper class and gives it to the lower class. Yes. They don't realize that, that was engineered by the Reagan administration. I mean, think about that for a second. Yes, I mean, yes, the, yes. The thing that now people attack is one of the most socialist tax policies in the Internal Revenue Code was actually designed by Reagan. Um, right. And of course, you know, he did it more from the, uh, uh, you know, corporate socialism standpoint, yeah. you know, effectively subsidized low wages, you know, and, and, uh, and put that on the government's credit card rather than, you know, on Wall Street and, you know, the publicly traded companies that could afford it. But, uh, but again, and I, wanted, know, I, and I wanted, sorry to inter, inter oh, yeah, Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I think I was, um, some time ago, I was listening to, I was reading an article in the Atlantic from David French, who said that, you know, the, the Republican Party is, changing it's no longer that part of individualism and free speech and so on and so forth with some of the bills that's going on and one of the things i've said is based on the context of the situations of the day and and based on your ability to to exact and to extend power so on and so forth but here you are saying that and you're speaking to the issue you you believe that the issue the earned income credit was an which is something that reagan would be would would is a social policy 
like somebody like Reagan would have um, voted. And it's not necessarily so. So although you are Republican, you also um, promote certain ideals. And you said something and you said something about being poor, your experience of being poor. And um, does that affect some of your policies, some of your ideas? You're, you seem very interdisciplinary because I was looking and, I'm, and, I, and I said to myself, you said on your website, you said you were born into a working class family, working class family, which is very important. And I just want to tell everybody, who, if, if you're listening to the program, and Mr. Castro has over 39,000 followers on this program. I have about 200. Mr. Castro reached out to me, and I was very moved by that. I am, but, but I can relate. So here you are, and you said you are trying to pro provide opportunity. And this is, a, this is a great, this speaks volume to me as an individual. The fact that you are trying to connect with individuals as a way to promote other initiatives. But you said, I want to talk on in on the issue of you we were born into a working class family and you said you were poor. And I, I was going to ask you a question early and I didn't get a chance to ask you the question. I said, here you are, Mexican-American. After college, you had $325,000 in debt. At, at 44 you are able to have a net worth of over, I, I looked it up, of over 20 million and a successful businessman. How are you able to accomplish this feat? And it's quite remarkable. Yeah, um, it's, it's a lot. Of, I used to say, I used to downplay it out of modesty yeah. and say that, you know, I've been lucky a lot. I still do think that I was lucky. I think there were a lot of times growing up, um, I could have ended up arrested. I could have ended up in jail. Um, you know, just that that's the, the uh, uh, I guess, the side effect of, of growing up in, in uh, you know, the poor neighborhoods. So I, I would clarify that we were born into a poor family. Yes, Through my yes. father's hard work, you know, 20 years in the army. Uh, yeah. And then after that, uh, working for you know, U.S. Mm. Customs and Border Protection and then having, you know, two retirement pensions, uh, yes. you know, we were able to live more of a, of a working class standard. Uh, but all of my family, all of them, um, have a very, we come from a poverty background. There's no yeah, question. Yeah. And so I know the struggles. I know the, the hurdles that are faced. Um, I, I know that sometimes you, you can't pick and choose who your friends are. You know, I didn't yeah. get to choose who I lived next door to. Um, right. And some of the troublemakers that, that uh, you know, I befriended growing up. And, uh, and thankfully, you know, there were times where I wasn't with them, where they did something, uh, you know, foolish and ended up in jail. And, you know, to this day, I'm thinking, wow, if I had decided to go with them that day, I, my whole life would have possibly been derailed. And how many other people out there are like me that could have had a successful company that, that you know, could be running for office, but made one mistake growing up. And now their whole life is, is you know, derailed as a result of it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty scary thinking about things like that. But, uh, you know, as far as what I did, I just, uh, I, I kept getting student loans. I kept studying. I kept getting more degrees. And I kept just hoping that <laughs> this is all going to pay off. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. And I know that, you know, unfortunately and sadly, a lot of people have done the exact same thing as me and not been as lucky, uh, yes. have not been as fortunate. And that's the reason that I'm not quick to say, like most people would, like, Oh, well, I did it. You know, you can do it too. Um, I feel like that's a, that's a myth that the system creates, you know, to, to basically use somebody like me as a poster boy to say that, you know, oh, look, you know, he did it through hard work and he was able to pay off all his $25,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. student loans in four years. Like, let's, let's be honest. Like, that's one in a million, if not one in a billion uh, chance right. that that would happen. And it happened to me. And, yeah. um, and again, I'm not going to pretend that, that that is something that's easily replicable. Right. So, you know, that being said, you know, that's why I want to look back at some of the hurdles that people face and try to find ways to correct it. You know, one yeah. solution idea that I had was to give a dollar for dollar tax credit uh, for all the principal paid back on yeah. student loans, not just the interest. And uh, let's be honest, the, the student loan interest deduction is crap. You know, it's, it's a small, <laughs> it reduces your, your tax bill by a few hundred bucks. What the hell is that? Right. Um, and so I, I would say dollar for dollar, uh, not only interest, but also the principal amount. So the way I view it is tax-free until debt-free. So as long as you're paying back your student loans, you shouldn't be paying into the tax system yet. And I feel like that would incentivize people to be like, you know, oh, okay, cool. You know, I can pay off my, 
a student loans now instead of paying my five thousand dollar tax bill. Um, yeah. And I feel like that's also a way of it's it's a it would incentivize people to go out there, start a business, and, and try to make it work, and at least be alleviated from these burdensome monthly payments. Like when yeah. Obama passed the income based repayment plan, that was a godsend for me. Um, <laughs> it was. You know, I was I was able to get my my bills down to practically nothing. And I feel like that's what actually helped me start my business. If I had been yeah. crippled with these monthly payments, I would have yeah. never started cash grown company, which you became a very successful international tax law firm. And I would have never been able to invent AI tax, which, uh, well, interestingly, it was just valued uh, last week at 180 million. So, right. Um, and I wanted to tell, and I wanted to ask you some questions about AI tax because you're you're a successful business, and you took, and you said it was just valued at how much? 180 million. Uh, trust me, that floored me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. And um, what is AI tax? What's that business about? Tell me something about it. Uh, so I had been working on this for the last two years here at the office. We called it the Manhattan Project because it was really secret. We didn't talk about it with anybody. And yes. um, <laughs> unfortunately, as a result of being very secretive, a lot of people thought that we were doing something nefarious. Um, but in <laughs> November of 2021, last year, I ended up getting awarded a 12 in one patent. So it's a patent covering 12 concepts from the US Patent and Trademark Office. And it covers artificial intelligence in the use of tax planning, tax legal defense and tax preparation. So basically it's like TurboTax on steroids. Um, you know, it's gonna help you through every aspect of your tax return. If you have questions about, oh, do I qualify for this deduction? It'll actually thoroughly vet you for any particular legal position. If you have a question about, like right now when you do your taxes, for example, it says, oh, list your dependents. But what if you have a question of like, well, you know, I took care of my niece or my nephew for a few months, like right. how to claim that person, you know, uh, unfortunately, right now you're at the mercy of Google, right? You have to do a bunch of Google searches and you're there for like two hours and then you're stressing yes. you're right or not, because you'll find 10 different answers to the same question online. Um, our software will actually guide you through a Q&A process that gives you a legal conclusion as to whether you can claim that person. And okay. so that's kind of like a, you know, very a opening part of the software, but it goes more. Yes. So uh, it, it'll even vet you for like treaty positions and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, basically it grabbed all the knowledge that I got in the yes. LLM program at Georgetown and, uh, and put it into software code. So. Oh, nice, nice. So not only were you uh, studying um, the theory and the principles, and the concepts of law, and what kind of attorney are you? Tax attorney? Uh, international tax, yeah. International tax, but you, but because you are very, you're young, you use the technology at your disposal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, um, now, the, my next question: I looked at um, some of your plans and some of your proposals, and um, and I, as I said, I couldn't. I, as I was reading your platform, I couldn't tell if you were Democrat or Republican. And I said, <laughs> I deliberately am not going to ask if you're Republican or Democrat because. To be honest, that is not important right now. And I actually did spoke with several individuals who are aware that I'm interviewing you. One young man was asking, oh, is he Republican or Democrat? You know, that's not important, man. You have to listen to, it, to, to the platform and what you're promoting. One of the things you recently, there is something about student loan and uh, where Biden is saying that um, he's considering uh, canceling or forgiving student loan debt. And there are Republicans such as Field who is saying that, no, uh, individuals and people, the, the economy is recovering now, but but of course, I don't know if that is true if the economy is recovering because um, econ the economy is suggesting it indicated that we're about to go into a recession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yet he's saying that um, we shouldn't continue to be, families shouldn't continue to bear, bear the burden of, um, uh, taxpayers shouldn't bear the burden of these students. But, I'm not, and, but I, you released a statement saying, I work my ass off, it off. But I'm the norm, and you just alluded to that. And, um, and you said, something about debt enslavement. And um, what was it that you said? Something, I think I made a note of it. I, oh, that, I mean, exactly how a lot of people in my, in my prior position feel, you know, it, it's uh, when, when you're struggling month by month, trying to earn enough to pay off your, your student loan, uh, yes. it, it, it does feel like debt enslavement. And, yes, yes, yes. you know, a lot of people will immediately, you know, on my side of the aisle will immediately say, well, it's their choice. You know, they went to college and it's yes. kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit insensitive to just like right. dismiss fellow Americans right away. Um, you know, colleges don't prepare you. If you, if you had parents like mine that didn't go to college, yes. you know, 
you don't have anybody advising you going in. Um, right. and, and, you know, they're like, oh, well, that's why at the college they have those advisors. Anybody that actually went to college is going to laugh at that suggestion right away, right? Because yeah, you, try right to, you try to meet with these advisors and they literally have a boilerplate statement that they just read every student. And you're just kind of like, okay, thanks. That didn't really help anything. Um, they don't give enough information on careers going into it. They don't tell yes. you what the salary expectation in this particular field is. Uh, they don't help you get a job afterwards. Some do, some do, yes. but not, not all of them. And especially not the ones, um, you know, in question, you know, that were very predatory, um, right. you know, where it was just literally a degree, a degree mill. And a yes. degree mill, you know, for, for those that don't know, is an institution that basically just promises you, you sign up and pay the tuition, you're going to get your degree, right? And then your degree is going to open up all these doors to all these opportunities. Um, but you don't realize that, you know, in the real world, people already know that university is just a degree mill. So they don't really give that degree any real weight. And so yes. you end up spending all this money to get this degree. And then, you know, it turns out that it's not really worth the paper it's printed on. Um, right. And in the business world, any contract where anybody fraudulently induces you into a contract is a voidable contract. As like contract 101, you know, you can't yeah. fraudulently induce and deceive people into a contract. Yet that's exactly what happened to a lot of these students. And yeah. so it's not a question of like, oh, should we just like uh, embrace a liberal policy of canceling student debt? It's no, should we enforce basic contract law, which is that they were fraudulently induced into getting this degree that's practically worthless. Um, yeah. and, and unfortunately, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> Democrats aren't the best at messaging sometimes. And, and I think it's because they're trying to express what the motivation is from their heart. And, right. uh, and Republicans, I, I see a lot of times are, are very motivated out of logic. It's just like, well, to me, that's yes. not logical. You chose this product and therefore you have to pay for this product. Um, and I wish that Democrats would approach situations from more of a very legal and, and analytical and, and logical standpoint. Like we understand that everybody's motivated you know, out of their heart, but I think if they messaged it better, they would be able to reach people on the other side. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I think there's been, there've been presidents like that on both sides. Clinton was really good at that. And that's why he got reelected twice. Uh, I think so was Obama. Um, and uh, you know, on the right, Reagan, you know, that's why there was a Reagan Democrats, you know, Reagan yeah. always was able to explain that, look, conservative policy isn't always just about analytics, data and logic. Like we have a heart, too. And he was always trying to find that middle ground, you know, and that's right. why he found that middle ground, like with the current income tax credit, you know, expansion of various social programs. Um, and he saw it as like, hey, this kind of benefits Wall Street. Right. You know, because it's going to subsidize some of the low wages paid by Walmart um, yes. you know, and, and all these companies. And so it even got Walmart, I mean, even got uh, Wall Street support, you know, for a lot of these policies, because he was able to find that middle ground. And I really think that, um, you know, that's what this country is, is missing again, you know, is, is somebody that can be that, that voice of bipartisanship to try to bring both sides together, and actually get things done. Because if not, we're always going to be in the stalemate. If, if we keep electing these, these extreme ideologues, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, everything, of course, is going to have a little bit of a conservative twist. I'm trying to reduce the, the federal deficit, pay down the, you know, the, uh, uh, our enormous freaking debt. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, yeah. And, how, and, you know, and I saw that you, that's part, you said that, uh, you said you're, 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 you're trying to reduce the federal deficit, but at the same time, you also believe that government have a responsibility to improve social services. And um, how can we um, do that? Both. How can we do? How can we improve social services while at the same time we do family? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that. I'm really glad you asked that because yes. when people saw my firm taking off, uh, it started turning heads. They were wondering, "How is this?" Because I graduated in 2013, um, and within three, four years, uh, my firm was uh, netting over a million dollars a year, and that yes. that turned heads real fast, uh, real real fast. Um, within a few years, I was interviewing people from Georgetown. I had just graduated a few years prior. And it, it's very, I was able to do this because I fully leveraged technology. At the end yes. of the day, that's all it was. I, I digitized marketing, whereas everybody before international tax attorneys would fly to countries, put on you know, these presentations at, at the Ritz Carlton or, or the Hilton um, and spend, have all this overhead. And to me, I always was trying to find a way how to do things on the lean. 
um, how to do things more efficiently, more effectively. And yeah. I was able to spend less and generate more. And that was not the, uh, the prevailing wisdom at the time. The prevailing wisdom yeah. at the time was you have to spend more to make more. And uh, I completely flipped that around. And yes. I was able to keep overhead and my margins so high um, that I got a lot of offers from big firms like Baker McKinsey, Baker Hostetler, Holland Knight. They wanted to onboard me as a partner yes. to try to find out what are you doing and how are you doing it? Um, and of course, when they couldn't figure it out, they were just like, oh, he has to be doing something nefarious. <laughs> it's just like no, it's called Google ads. It's called Facebook yes. ads. Um, yes. But I brought it up one time at a conference uh, by this attorney who I knew was kind of following me, kind of curious as to how my firm was growing so fast. And he asked me how how I spend my marketing money. And I said, uh, I said, well, a good chunk of it is actually on Facebook. And his response, never going to forget his response. He was like, the place where my kids hang out? And I was just like, you know what? It's that attitude of yes. <laughs> not generating any revenue. Um, yes. And it's because what a lot of people didn't know and what was unfortunately weaponized by uh, Trump in 2016 was the, the power of what's called micro-targeting on, on social media. I don't want to get too far off track, but Yes. It was those types of techniques of keeping overhead down, but yes. still maximizing by, by focusing on, on efficiency. Uh, and I realized you can bring this to the federal government. You can bring yes. this to social programs. Um, one of the things that AI, the AI Tax Corporation that, that we're about to go public with uh, is going to do is we're, we want to do what Elon Musk did for NASA. We want to do for the U.S. Department of Treasury. Right. We actually want to come into the U.S. Department of Treasury, start digitizing a lot of the offices. Uh, in particular, in the Internal Revenue Service, uh, yes. we wanted to be able to digitize collections, um, uh, client correspondence. Uh, uh, a lot of there's a lot of aspects that can be digitized. Yes. And the the fact that I was able to build a company that has now you know has a value of 180 million dollars is proof that I know what yes. I'm doing. I know how to actually get this done. And the same can be done with social programs. It yes. can. Um, it's just that we keep on using the old school approach to social programs and, uh, yes. and it's very costly. It's very inefficient. And that's why people get very frustrated with government services, right? You know, they always equate government bureaucrats with sloth, you know, that's just there. Yes. Typing with, <laughs> with <laughs> and, uh, and it's because it, it is a very accurate uh, uh, sentiment, you know, um, but but yeah, that, that's the approach that I would bring, which is just bringing a lot of our social programs, a lot of our departments and agencies into the 21st century, uh, reducing that overhead and making it much, much more efficient. Wow, this is, this is powerful. Thank you so much for that. And um, so you are bringing real life issues. You're bringing what you have learned as an entrepreneur, as a successful businessman and applying it to, to government. As a way to um, as a way to make create change, and of course, you talk about the, the digital issue. There are questions I could ask about digitizing stuff. There are fears about the digital world with, in terms of privacy and security. And stuff. oh yeah, yeah, there's definitely those concerns. I don't know, I don't know um, um, President, um, former President Obama is right now um, talking about um, looking at how we can regulate um, communication and information. And uh, I have oftentimes said that social media is one of the greatest victories for movements and for people everywhere because. What it does is it decentralizes information or control and communication is to make popular what was the monopoly. So um, in one end, we want to regulate information, but at the other end, we have to be careful because regulating information, there's very, there are various suspicions around regulating information because there are those who say, what do you believe about, what is your position on um, regulation of information? Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful and that's something that we, we are very cognizant of as well. Um, you know, there's a, a code provision 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code, which, you know, mandates, um, you know, taxpayer privacy. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, you know, one thing that I think that we really need is, uh, you know, we have Air Force, we have Army, uh, we have Marines, now we have Space Force. Um, yeah. I think we need a digital force. And I, I think it needs to be its own branch of government, you know, and unfortunately, uh, instead, what we've done is we've created these sub agencies with or sub departments within each agency, right? So the CIA has their their digital command, uh, NSA, NRO. You know they all have their digital command. So does Army, Air Force, Navy. Um, but the problem is that it, it it's such a new it's it's like a platform for potential warfare now, right? Like they even talk about cyber warfare, 
And so yeah. it's kind of like, you know, the Air Force is in charge of the air, Navy's in charge of the water, Army's in yes. charge of the land. And um, the, but we need, we do need a cyber force and it needs to be right. in charge of the digital, the digital space. And that yeah. way you get, you get all these sub departments from all these various agencies, whether it's CIA, um, DIA, yeah. even DEA, all, all of them, the DEA has a really good cyber force, um, put them all together. Yeah. And now you've got the best and brightest minds all finally under one roof working together. Um, yeah. And that's what's very difficult to accomplish. It's the same reason why they realized that even space was becoming its, its own almost like battlefield, right? And that's why they had to bifurcate now, you know, the air from zero gravity space, you know, and that's right. why we decided to spin off and create Space Force, which I think was actually a really smart move. Um, yeah. But I, I think the, the real one that's, that's current now and present is the digital space. And, yeah. uh, and unfortunately, that one is, uh, is, is very fractured. Yes, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, think, um, I, I think I published an article some time ago talking about the next threat to the world, the next war is on the digital front. And uh, because, uh, look what's happening with Russia and with China and so on, and um, the issue of privacy, information. And I talked about the, the information sharing between countries and, the, and the wars between countries can create escalate even further privacy issues. I think privacy issue is a major issue. And um, I think um, there's not much policy around security um, or privacy. I, personally speaking, I've had tremendous issues with um, per, uh, digital security and privacy and data leaks. So that is something I believe that, um, I guess, as, as people, we need to, uh, as leaders, we need, we need to start exploring um, because you have access to to the digital again that can create problems oh yeah yeah and and just so so i'm uh really clear one thing i i agree with well i don't even say agree with the libertarians because i haven't heard them say this um so it has to do with the fourth amendment um yes when the 14th amendment was passed for example uh you know in the 1860s it didn't really have any teeth to it until yes. uh almost 50 years later when they decided yes. almost 100 years later and they decided to expand the 14th Amendment to private actors. Before, it was only seen as um, applying to the government, kind of like freedom of speech, right? Like yes. Congress shall pass no law abridging, you know, the freedom of speech. Um, it, or, uh, you know, I can't remember the, the precise wording, but you get the point. It, it, it limits government involvement, not private involvement, right? So that's yes. why, you know, when big tech companies uh, engage in censorship, it doesn't violate the First Amendment. But one of the things that I have advocated for is we need to extend the Fourth Amendment to private companies, because unfortunately, okay. this loophole has been exploited by our own intelligence community. And right. what they've done is they've effectively subcontracted a lot of digital espionage to private companies that then when they violate the Fourth Amendment, they're like, oh, well, you know, that was them. You know, it wasn't right. us. Yeah, they, they, they yes, was, yes. Private contractors. And um, and I think that's that's very unfortunate. And it needs to be reined in, and that yeah. makes me no friend of the intelligence community. Um, but uh, but it, we, I need to call it as I see it, and uh, and it's a problem. It's being grossly abused, uh, yeah. and uh, and I could go on a long time on that one. But uh, yes. but of course, another one where a lot of people get sensitive is the First Amendment. Um, I don't pick and choose, uh, you know, which amendments I like, and I do think that the First Amendment. It's about time that it extends to private companies as well. Yes. Yes. If they're if they are deemed to be engaged in providing a public domain and a public forum, mm -hmm. I believe that it should. Now, of course, then that sounds like I'm defending Trump and the fact that he was banned from a lot of these programs. Um, yes. Unfortunately, you know, he would benefit from something like this. Um, right. Again, I, I think I never think about the current situation. I think what if the tables are reversed? Right. Um, you know, and you always have to think things that way. And yes. um and again, that's that's what our founding fathers were always focused on is, you know, what happens if, um, you know, the other side gets this or, you know, so, yeah. so you get the point. But, yeah, I, I really think that the Fourth Amendment should be extended to private actors. And uh, and that would include a lot of these data companies. So if they violate your privacy rights, you would have grounds to then sue them in federal court. This is quite interesting. There's, you know, there are, I have a tremendous amount of questions to ask you about some really questions. People are asking about issues of subscription. The issue, the fact that we are now, companies are now, are now requiring subscriptions. People don't purchase products anymore and pay a one-time fee. Now you rent. 
And, um, and people talk about how that creates more poverty, in a sense, because now you have to shell out more money. So that affects incomes over time. And then, of course, there are people doing research that looks at the correlation between what customers in society are now requiring to pay, because now you're not paying a one-time fee, now you're paying fees, a subscription. And, and um, I wanted to find out what are the views of our political leaders, since they are doing that, some of the questions people were asking about, many things that are now subscription-based, that's now creating more poverty. That is, and in a sense, that creates strategy that provides more wealth for some people, but it creates more income disparities and more lack of people in society. Yeah. I thought about the issue of subscription and fee for service and how that is how that is changed the way in which how we look at customers and how we pay for products and stuff. How is that changing in society and how and how that creates problems for consumers and so on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and unfortunately I, I feel a lot of that was initially mo motivated by tax policy. Um, yeah. because if you sell a CD ROM at Best Buy for Microsoft Word. Uh, yes. Now that's US based income. But if you sub license the technology out to the Netherlands, and then yes. um, that Dutch holding company sub licenses a subscription fee out, um, you know, so like a temporary license, then yes. now Dutch source income, even though it's a US customer. And so that yes. was initially, it was actually tax policy that drove that, that new design. But okay. then you started realizing they were making more money off of it, right? You right. Know, it's not just a hundred dollar, quick hundred bucks. You know, it's, yeah. it's less, it's only 15 a month, but mm. it's 15 a month for life, you know, right, so they've got a customer for life pretty much. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is one of the byproducts of uh, uh, free market capitalism. And I think that somebody needs to step in and provide an alternative. But how do you do that if the yes. government's not enforcing antitrust legislation? So uh, antitrust legislation, for those that don't know, um, I, I can go into long history of why they use the word trust, but it's basically monopolies, right? Yeah. Uh, monopolies are illegal because you're using your power to effectively uh, and unlawfully neutralize competition. And so right. it does, it's, it's anti-capitalism when you think about it. It doesn't create competition because the idea of, co of capitalism is that competition um, allows the best to prevail, right? So right. if you put a bunch of burger joints you know, in a mall, you know, uh, 12 months later, most of them will go bankrupt and go under, right? Because the one who makes the best meals and has the best customer service is going to be the one that prevails. And that's a theory behind capitalism. Monopolies, on the other hand, is the uh, one restaurant sabotaging all the others so that they go yeah. under. And that way you're forced to buy their product regardless of whether it's good customer service or not. Think yeah. of at and in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> yes. um, and so, uh, but, but what's happening right now is that they're not enforcing uh, this, these uh, anti-monopoly laws. Why? Because these monopolies got even smarter. Uh, they stopped not only neutralizing their competition, but neutralizing political opposition. And they engaged in lawful bribery through our lobbying system uh, yes. to effectively, again, uh, manipulate our, our democratic processes to further you know, entrench themselves you know, as, as the dominant force within a particular industry. And, uh, and again, this is not gonna make me any friends. <laughs> You know, in, yes. in the corporate community and the ones that know that they're engaging in this, they can be like, okay, right. I don't know much about how we operate. But, um, but, but that is the truth, exactly how they operate. And so it's, it's a multifaceted approach. We need to go after the lobbying laws um, and, and the way that lobbying is done. It's, it's been corrupted and eroded over time to where basically now it's just legalized bribery. That's all it is. That's all it is. And that's why when I ran my congressional campaign and I self-funded with like 500,000 of my own money, I didn't take a single dollar because I didn't want that, that type of undue influence because no matter what any politician says, if somebody is, if a group of people and they all work for one company and they're all giving you 25,000 and they helped you raise $500,000, if they're basically bankrolling your entire political campaign, you can say you are independent as much as you want, but at the end of the day, if they, if they tell you to do something, you're gonna do it. And you know, I feel like a lot of politicians just try to limit their corruption, right? Like, well, yeah. only only for these groups of people. And it's because I kind of agree with them on most of the things. Um, and and it, it, you're effectively like negotiating your soul, right? Yes, <laughs> and, yes. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we, we need changes to the lobbying laws. That, that needs to be more tightly regulated. It's been way too loosened and watered down, um, you know, since the times of, of Kennedy when I feel like it was uh, a little bit better. But uh, 
that, you know, coupled with, uh, you know, our tax policy, which actually drove, like I said, this, this initial uh, subscription based model and, um, and, and then the enforcement of antitrust legislation. So attacking these monopolies, breaking them up to allow new competitors to come into the market. I think all those three things combined would, would be the way to address that particular problem. Thank you. And um, I have another question for you um, as we get ready to, not too long from now. And they have a lot, ton load of other questions, but I was, um, I think I, I interviewed uh, one of my professors, Dr. Martin Oppenheimer, one of the mentors in my life. And of course, one of the questions I'm going to ask you before we end is, who is your greatest influence and greatest inspiration in your life? Where do you draw inspiration at some of the point? And I know what I read where you said Americans, and we can explore that. But beyond that, I want to know, I want to go deeper. But before that, there is something in the news about young people and what they're doing. And you said some time ago, two days ago, stop looking to the government for help with income disparity and the wage gap. Get off your, get off your whatever. And, um, and you and your nice. Stop asking and start demanding, fight for it. And I know at Amazon, young people are out there demonstrating and this is if young, and then over the weekend, young people organized a stop the violence march and so on and so forth. So for, you are here, you, 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 are, you said, so this was quite profound. And I, I, saw, I thought it was quite powerful when you said that one of the ways we can create change is to stop asking for it and to unionize. And I think, um, you, I study unions as well as, and that's in my book, Neoliberalism, Globalization. Unions are in the decline in the U.S. and it's they're still weak. But um, how, what is your proposal in terms of, in terms of um, this issue of unions and so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, again, this is, to me, this is free market capitalism. And again, yes. uh, with a lot of capitalists, you know, when we bring up, uh, whenever I bring up unions, they're always just like, oh, you know, well, we don't like that, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> so, yes. So you yes. like individual responsibility and you like right. individual freedoms, but not mm-hmm. when those freedoms are uh, an organized effort to demand higher wages and better benefits. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, again, it's, it's a little bit of that, uh, you know, political hypocrisy. But, uh, but yeah, absolutely. You know, this is free market capitalism. It's freedom yes. of contract. And just like, uh, you know, I as a business owner, I'm free to, you know, engage in business. Um, yeah. My employees are free to organize if they feel that I'm mistreating them uh, yeah. or not paying them properly. Okay. All my employees get paid uh, very, very well and, uh, and yeah. have very, very generous health benefits as well. Um, I do that because of my background, because I'm a union. Yes. Leader, and I want to make sure that, you know, uh, I take care of them. They're healthy and happy. Uh, they're going to be healthy and happy making this company more money. Um, yeah. And we're all going to, you know, benefit, uh, you know, together as a result of it. So, yeah. uh, that being said, I absolutely support unions. I, I think that, you know, whenever I, I'm against centralization of power in any sense, whether it's in the, con- whether, whether it's wealth, um, whether it's the income disparity, I don't like it whenever things are one-sided. I like things balanced. I, that's right. that's really what, what I'm about. Um, and so when I see that in, in gross imbalance, you know, uh, with companies that are make, posting billions and billions in profit, and yet their employees are, are going home and, and checking on their, you know, uh, housing benefits and checking on their uh, SNAP food benefits. Um, it, to me, that, that's, that's upsetting. Um, and it, it's because these companies can afford to pay living wages. Yeah. Yet they, and, and they have economists, you know, and, and, and their financial office that actually take this into account. Well, you know, if we pay them at this level, they'll be eligible for these benefits. And so it's as though their salary is actually up here. And what you're actually saying is we can effectively shift this onto the government's credit card, right? The national right. just keeps going higher and higher. We've already just like become numb to it. Um, and, and I disagree with that. I disagree with that wholly. I, I think this burden needs to go where it belongs, which is you have a duty, you have a responsibility toward your talent, towards your team, yeah. you know, towards your employees. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I think it's, it's a result of the, the, uh, the eighties, you know, where things were just, uh, you know, very disconnected. For example, most people, this is a concept that, that most people don't even really think about, but it's small things like this, this that matter. Yeah. What do we call the department that's in charge of managing all of the talent and all of your team members? We call it human resources. Right. Think about what that, think about that term for a second, a human resource. What is a resource? A resource is something that you extract, you expend, and then yeah. there's something that's left over the byproduct and you just discard it. Like garbage. Yes. Um, 
And what are me and you, you know? Yeah, we're human beings, but you know, we're, we're people, we're, we're family, we're team members, we're, we're right. husbands, fathers, brothers. Um, but calling it, calling a person a human is as disconnected. As right. It is. Yes. And so yes. referring to, to your people as human resources, you know, is, is just <laughs> about as, as, uh, gross as it can get when you think about it but yeah uh, we've, we've just come to to accept that term but that's why even here we refuse to call it human resources you know we call it yes, yes, talent, yes. talent management department you know it's just like at the end of the day that's what we're doing you know we're managing yes. our talent we're helping develop them we're treating them like family um and again i think it starts with with terminology and then yes. from there we can start changing you know the way that we do business and, and conduct business yes okay then then uh Two more questions as we get to wrap up, but you said that um, you said some time ago that um, I'm probably the only Republican who's been calling for long-term investments in solar, wind, and hydroelectric energy for years. And you went on to say, everyone wants energy independence. They just don't want liberal green energy companies to get rich accomplishing it. But the question is, you believe that we can, and I know, and I, you know, you all, you said you are a balanced person and like that. Because some, some time before you talked about the fact that you want you still want to look at oil, oil drilling and explore so that, in the, um, so that we can become more independent, um, energy independent. So what are your views in terms of how do we, at the same time, what are your views in terms of um, views on the, the planet and um, um, the ozone layer and, um, and the position and, and at the same time developing in, energy independence while exploring solar energy and so on and uh, and many if this is some of these things are new concepts and you're a young american you're a young american so in a way you get an opportunity to lead the charge and to educate people some more about that but and so i would like to hear your position on this yeah yeah absolutely you know so no unfortunately the republican party used to be known as as the party of environmentalism um yes. under Teddy roosevelt he was a big environmentalist he's one that that really advocated for the expansion of the national parks system in the United States. And, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, I, I feel like the Republican Party just uh, got derailed, you know, and yes. they equated environmentalism with, uh, you know, through tree hugging. And, uh, and it's just kind of like, <laughs> look, it's, it's about, you know, when I, when I talk to my fellow Republicans about this, I, I like to do the Christian angle, which is that, yes. uh, you know, we are stewards of God's earth. That's yes. at the end of the day, like, yes, we're Republican, we're Democrats, we're this, we're that. Um, but we also have a duty towards God and duty towards preserving this earth and yes. all of its majestic beauty. I've seen a lot of it and it's gorgeous and I don't want to see it ruined. Um, yes. And even if there's a 1% chance that humans could be contributing to this, uh, why not? You know, and yes. also let's look at it from a national security standpoint. Do we really want to stay reliant on Saudi oil? You know, do we, do we really want that? Um, and so... There, and, and of course, people like uh, will say like, oh, well, there's a difference between oil and coal, right? You know, coal is for the electricity, oil is for gasoline. But it's like, yeah, but if we increased domestic production of the grid, yeah. like, for example, I'll give you a quick example. If everybody tomorrow bought a Tesla and started driving a Tesla tomorrow, we'd have blackouts yeah. nationwide. Why? Because the grid can't support it because it doesn't, it doesn't create that much electricity yet. We'd have to like pump out more coal. And so the only way to really sustain putting all these vehicles on the grid is to start expanding the grid and empowering the grid with more, infusing it with more energy. And so that is going to require uh, more wind turbines, you know, and, and, and now it's just gotten ridiculous, right? Like now, now most people uh, that are anti-green energy, uh, which I hate calling it green energy, it's just infinite sources of energy. And uh with these free infinite sources of energy, right? That God gave us, it's the wind, it's the sun, it's the water. Um, you, God's basically like, I gave you guys this free energy and you, yes. you're not using it, what else wrong with you? <laughs> um, and so it's like, we need to in, be investing in this infrastructure. You know, it's, it, to me, it's like, it's God's infrastructure. Let's invest in this, let's expand it. And if we had this, we'd be able to shift more vehicles onto the grid. And that means less oil. We wouldn't need as much oil. And that would again decrease our reliance on these foreign imports of, of oil and that goes towards energy independence but what people don't understand is that energy independence is, is, isn't some finish line right like yeah. we accomplished it for a few months uh, under obama we accomplished it for a few months under trump uh, but something always happens why because you think the saudis are fools 
they know what we're trying to do. And they're always yeah. going to try to engineer some sort of international crisis or issue or, or market manipulation in order to uh, frustrate our ability to become independent. You know, yes. think of it like a drug dealer, you know, like if you see mm -hmm. the person trying to go clean, you're going to try to find a way to, to make them, you know, reliant on your product, just like the subscription service. You know, yes. they, they see that, you know, there might be new market entrants that are going to offer flat fees again. They'll do everything yes. in their monopolistic power to frustrate that and to derail those plans. So yes. that being said, um, you know, energy independence is something that is, is not just like a one-time accomplishment. It's something that we need to accomplish and then sustain because there are going to be market participants out there, i.e. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> They're going to do everything in their power to try to frustrate that and try to prevent that from happening. And so uh, when we view it as a national security issue, I think that would get more conservatives on board. Um, but like I said, what I've generally found is that uh, they don't want to support this because a lot of the people leading these companies tend to lean uh, left. And so yes. they're like, oh, no, yes. now we're just, we're just making a new generation of liberal billionaires and, and they don't want to be part of that. And it's just kind of like, okay. it's yeah. frustrating. <laughs> it is frustrating. And that's part of the suspicion. And uh, I have four, three questions, quick questions to begin. Um, that some young people ask me. This is Zion Shadeen. She is 17 years old. She's a singer, songwriter, rapper, producer from Virginia, but now lives in Philadelphia. Been living in Philadelphia for 10 years, I think. She said, to, she said, Mr. Castro, what steps are you taking in order to move us forward as society? What are you doing for us, for the positivity of the people? I, I'm so sorry. I, I had a, an alarm go off. Can, can you repeat that sorry. one last time? Yes, she, asked, she says, what, what steps are you taking or will you take in order to move us forward as a society? What are you doing for us or for the positivity of the people? I think it's bringing that bipartisanship back. Okay. I, I think okay. that's it. Um, it we, what, unfortunately, social media uh, and the internet age, I mean, because what do you think about it? The internet age is brand new, right? As human yes. beings, we've just been given this new service that allows all of us to communicate. And yes. what did we do? We all retreated into our echo chambers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yes. In, yes. Instead of communicating with each other, we just, we did the same freaking thing we were already doing before. Right, uh, we yes. We just did it in the digital, in the, uh -huh. the digital space. Um, and I think that, that that's unfortunate. Um, I used to really enjoy shows like Crossfire where you'd have somebody representing the liberals and somebody representing the conservatives and yes. they would each hash out their ideas. Um, they try things similar to that now, but you can tell that if it's a left-wing program, they bring in the most ridiculous right-wing person. And then yes. if it's a right-wing program, they bring in the most ridiculous left-wing person, right? That way it makes the other side look ridiculous. Um, but I'm talking about bringing in intellectuals on both sides and having these, these public forums and these very uh, respectable public debates Yes. And that way, people get educated. People understand where, okay, now I see where the Republicans are coming from on this issue. I still disagree with them, but at least I know that they're not totally ridiculous or they're not motivated yes. out of you know something evil. Uh, I truly believe that everybody, everybody is motivated out of love for this country. We just have, and we all want to get to where we're going, right? Which is a better country, yes. a better nation. We just have a different a difference of opinion as to what that is and how to get there. That's the only thing. But we all love this country. Liberals, yes. far left, they love this country. Uh, Republicans, far right, they love this country. We're, we all love this country. We just, again, we disagree on the means and, and the, the end goal. Uh, but again, and I think it's what I view a really important part of my candidacy is going to be bridging that, uh, that ideological divide, bridging that uh, those echo chambers. And, and I know Obama tried that one. Sorry to interrupt you. That was about platform at once. I think I remember some time Obama, when Obama became president, he wanted to bipart lead by, 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 by partisanship and he wanted to bring everybody together. But um, the first couple of years, it was very difficult to get anything through and so on and so forth. Exactly. And, yeah, and so, I uh, look, when you're, when you're talking with people, the American people in particular, the American electorate, the American voters, um, I think that's that was his golden opportunity, and I think he did it extremely well. Obviously, yes, election, yes. You know? um, But once you have power, you you mm. can't be shy about utilizing it. Yes. And I felt like, unfortunately, that that would be my critique of Obama's first two years in office. Yes. Which is that he was given a mandate, and 
he didn't have the I'm going to take a lot of heat for this. He didn't have the courage to use it. Yes, and yes. I really felt that that was a, a missed opportunity on his part, right? You know, for a lot yeah. of his his plans and his agenda. Um, but of course, when you saw that Trump got that same effective mandate and they got yes. Yes. Uh, he was uh, not afraid about using it. And that's uh, why he, a lot of his policies got enacted. Um, and, and he was really to able to, to reshape and reform the federal government uh, yes. in a lot of very unique and, uh, and unprecedented ways. Yes. And a lot of people, of course, uh, on the left were extremely upset at that. But yes. one thing I always yes. said is, hey, he was given power. At least he has the courage to use it. And, yes. and he's using it very, very effectively. And so, uh, you know, again, there, there's when you're campaigning, it's, it's about enlightening your fellow Americans, bringing everybody together so that they can make a, a wise and informed decision about who they want to lead their nation. Yes. But after that, when you're given power, it's, it's not election mode anymore. It's, it's time to use that power and, right. and to put your policies and, and what people voted and believed in, it's time to yes. put that into action. Um, you know, so in other words, the campaigning, it's talk. Once you're in power, it's action. And, yes. uh, and I, I feel like that's unfortunately where some politicians go wrong. They get in power and they want to keep talking. Right. And it's been like, <laughs> man, like the time for talking's over. Like they gave you the power. To talk, you know? Yeah, it's time for action. <laughs> and you are a man of action, it seems. And, um, and, but, you know, I know we've been talking for probably an hour, but I have two, and I know we've said an hour, but. Oh, do you have any more time for? Yeah, yeah, I have time. Yeah. Oh, great. So here's, a, here's another question. What do you believe is the best way to change our community? Well, I guess this is, and you've already alluded to that um, by saying that, you know, brick communist, but this is Jaden, a young man. Um, and he says that he's about 17 years old. He said, what do you believe is the best way to change our community? And another young man, Zachary says, how would you change around what's going on? Um, every now and then, there's lots of helicopters and sirens, as if we are a surveillance community. And this is a young man in Philadelphia. And if you don't, and Philadelphia, in many, com- I mean, in these communities, Chicago, so on, they're beset by violence, and the violence is on the rise. And um, while poverty and is, you know, people are falling in, falling, poverty is on the increase, and not just poverty, but even people who are already poor are experiencing abject poverty, and so on and so forth. So. Um, so these are some of the questions. And so any, what would you like to respond to Zachary here and Jaden? How would you change around what's going on every now and then? There is lots of helicopters and sirens. I guess it's alluding to the violence. It probably maybe because what's going on in Philadelphia, and I guess that's more specific, but would, would, would you want to talk about gun violence and so on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, so it's what I had mentioned before about, you know, how yeah. we're becoming a surveillance state. Um, and it's because, uh, you know, uh, the Fourth Amendment is, I mean, as it applies to the government has already been severely watered down and then it doesn't yeah. even apply to private actors. So, you know, if you're a government agency, all you have to do is subcontract out, uh, you know, surveillance to, um, you know, a, a private market participant and there you go, you completely circumvent the Fourth Amendment. Um, but yes, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate that we, you know, we have to balance the, the need to effectively police communities and keep, you know, families safe, but, you know, also, you know, it, in other words, it, we need to think of new ways of, of policing. Yeah. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I can I can see the police department's efforts here of just like, hey, look, we're trying to keep families safe, right? I grew up in the hood. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I swear yes. that's like, you know, uh, j- just before, actually, before I, I go into this, let me just give a little bit of background on that. Just yes. so that people, people can know that I can relate. Um, right. You know, when people say, oh, what was it like for you growing up? Uh, growing up for me was Saturday night. Uh, playing basketball in the street with my friends and then having to hit the floor because an AK-47 started sounding off down the street. Yeah. Um, there was there was a crack house down at the end of, the, of my street in Laredo, Texas on Elm Street. People want to look it up if they don't believe me. Uh, my yeah. aunt lived at 818 East Elm Street, Laredo, Texas. That's where I lived. And right down the street was an apartment complex. And um, there were three times where there were drive-by shootings. Uh, so that was my childhood. My childhood was calling the police with active gunfire uh, going off and then the police showing up 35 minutes later, 35 minutes later. Yeah. Uh, yet now that I live in a very affluent neighborhood, um, I call the police about, I can see a suspicious animal and there'll be a police, you know, there'll be like yeah. two police uh, uh, vehicles outside my front door within three to four minutes tops, you know, so like 160 seconds there at my front door. So I know what it's like. 
I know what it's like. Um, and the difference is I grew up a little bit upset with, with police officers because how I felt that they discriminated in their ability to provide uh, effective policing to poor areas. Yeah. But then in the 90s, you know, as I got older, I started seeing how uh, there was over policing. Right. And so then the police departments were just like, oh, well, you know, these poor people are never happy, right? You know, we under police, they complain. We over police, they complain. Well, again, it's like what I said before, I'm all about balance, moderation, you know? And, um, and fortunately, we, we've become an extreme society where we either are extreme, we're not going to give you any policing, um, or we're going to over police the hell out of you. <laughs> yeah. so it's kind of like, again, yes. we have to find that balance. And, you know, I would want to look more into that particular issue of what's going on in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, bring it to my attention because I'd want to see how we can strike that balance. But the fact that there are young people, you know, complaining about it would suggest to me that they've, they've gone to the extreme end now, you know, which is over policing. Or like, uh, you know, how in Chicago at one point the police threatened to not provide any policing to the poor. Yes. Like, oh, you're protesting against it? We're not going to provide right. any mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I understand their frustration. I get it um, from the police side and and from the community side. But again, I think it's because we're failing to to find that 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 balance, that moderation. And so, uh, you know, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll want to look a lot more into that. But uh, like I said, I, I think it would likely stem from an overreaction and uh, yes, of over policing. You know, you talk about balance, and um, my next question is going to be, what are your greatest fears? But how do we find how do we find that balance? And you're aspiring to be one of the, the leaders of the few world, as I said, we say. And um, how do we find that balance? And I guess that's probably one of your greatest work as a, as, if you were to be, as to become president, if you were to become president, how do you find that balance? And what, do you, what will you do in order to um, get to that balance? Yeah, I mean, I believe that, um, I believe with, with the brain and with the wisdom that God gave me and yes. with all the life circumstances that, that he put me in, gave me a very well-rounded view of the world. I've been on the far left. I've been yes. out in the streets marching for living wages and unionizing actual workers. I've been out right. of uh, boots on the ground. And now I've been on the other side. I've been yes. a business owner. I've been in charge of employees and payroll, uh, millions uh, in payroll. And, and having to decide on how to provide health benefits in an affordable way for the business that's sustained. Yes. You know, so now I got to see the other side, like, you know, oh, wow, this stuff isn't free, you know? Yes, <laughs> Somebody yes. has to pay for it, you know? And, uh, and, and, and finding, again, that, that balance. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't think it's something that, uh, that can necessarily be found by anyone other than somebody that has a very well-rounded experience. And we need to find that, these well-rounded leaders that can look at both sides and find that common ground. It's, it's very hard, um, but again, it's, it's something that I have found that um, I have a knack for. I'm, I'm yeah. able to sit down with Republicans and get them to quickly see both sides. Again, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative. I'm still gonna lean towards my party's policy positions, but I'm gonna try to find a way to accomplish these goals in a way that's palatable for liberals. So for example, again, Reagan, what did Reagan want to do? He wanted to support Wall Street. He wanted to see a big economic boom. And so what did he do? He found a way to subsidize wages for these corporations yes. by putting it on government's credit card. How did he do that? The earned income tax credit, right? It's a very novel way. Now we can yes. look at it in retrospect and say, hey, that's corporate socialism, right? That's corporate handouts. Um, let's try to find a way, like now that we're a healthy economy again, let's try to shift it back to companies. But maybe we're about to enter into a recession, so maybe we should maintain it for a while. Um, but it's, it's that type of seeing both sides and fully understanding it that empowers me with the ability to yes. find that middle ground um, and to, to stay away from to- toxic ideology. Again, yes. I still believe in conservative principles. That's the foundation. That's what drives all my policy positions. Yes. But I'll always do it in a way where we can get at least 70, 75% of the public behind it. Um, yes. And again, that, that was the artful tactic of Bill Clinton. That was the artful tactic of Ronald Reagan. You know, yes, there's no question Ronald Reagan was a Republican conservative, right? He's like the hero, (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. but he was still able to reach out to the other side and get people. And Clinton as well. There's no question he was a Democrat. There's no question he was a liberal, but he was able to reach out to the other side. 
and find ways to get them to buy in to the positions. And so, again, that's that's what my candidacy is about. It's it's probably not the right time, you know, because we're we're hyper politicized. But it has to start somewhere, and it's going to start with my candidacy. Yeah, I'm going to start. And um, one last question. question. Yes, and I'm um, sorry, sorry to cut you off right there. One one older gentleman said, um, "Oh, I'm concerned about my Medicare. Do you have any position in healthcare, or uh, just reach out to the to the seniors who I spoke with? Many persons said, what are your plans for Medicare and so on? He said, please, please, I love Medicare. Please don't do too much with it. Are you, um, what are your positions on Medicare? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Medicare is great. I want to leave it where, where it's at. Um, okay. As far as our healthcare system, I wanted to do something that was pretty similar, but a little bit different with a capitalist twist of what the Brits did with the national yes. um, the, the healthcare system. Um, I wanted to create a national healthcare council, but kind of like, and this is where libertarians hate the, the analogy, but this is the only analogy, unfortunately, I can make, but yes. again, we is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, a lot of people don't know this, it's really a, a, a brokered power sharing agreement between the banking establishment and the United States government. Okay. And uh, it, there's a whole book on it, you know, called The Creature of Jekyll Island. And, uh, and just for my- Creature of friends, Jekyll Island, guys. Yeah, yeah. The Creature of Jekyll okay. Island was, uh, it was actually a negotiation that took place on an island called Jekyll Island, um, yes. you know, which, you know, it sounds like Mr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. uh, and what they did is they created this new system, the Federal Reserve, and their their shared power between the CEOs of the major banks and then government bureaucrats. And together they create uh, monetary policy and, and set banking policy. Um, and, and unfortunately, as much as libertarians hate this, it was the best we could do at that time because there was a, there was a lot of dangers and, and, and a lot of the cons outweigh the pros when you central have a, a just a, a regular U.S. central bank, um, right. it, 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 I too much for to go into this episode, but yes. you know if if people read the book The Creature of Jekyll Island, they would understand. I want to learn from that, but build something similar but better, avoiding those mistakes that we made with the Federal Reserve, and create a national healthcare council. Yeah. And having the national healthcare council and putting all those companies together, along with you know government bureaucrats. Um, what that effectively does is it creates a de facto single payer system, but it's a privatized single payer system. And so by doing that, we would be able to dramatically drive down healthcare costs. Um, the power elite that's currently in power, the status quo, wouldn't object to it, right? Because it's further entrenching their power by putting yes. them on the permanent council, much like the Federal Reserve. That's why the banking CEOs ex accepted it when the Federal Reserve was created, because they knew that, hey, this is making us pretty much like permanent uh, fixtures of the yes. United States economic system. And so this would be the one way where Wall yeah. Street would be on board, liberals would be on board because they'd be like, well, it's a de facto, you know, uh, single payer system, let's, let's do it. And, uh, and, and I think it, and it would drive down healthcare costs. And so the entire American public and electorate could get behind it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's what they always say, the devil's in the details, you know, so we yes. have to broker this and, and negotiate in a way um, where we're not just thinking of an immediate solution, but the fact that this could be a, a permanent part of our system for the next 150 years, so we have to make sure we get it right. I felt like they rushed to the Federal Reserve System, and that's why they call it the creature of Jekyll Island, you know, because, yes. uh, you know, it, 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 it was just fraught with uh, a lot of loopholes, and, and uh, which opens the door to potential abuses. But, uh, but that, that would be my solution. And again, best of both worlds, you know, uh, yes. the right would not object to that. They'd actually kind of like the idea. Um, liberals would too. Again, it's not an everybody's dream. You know, neither side would be totally happy, uh, but it would be a permanent uh, solution to fixing fixing our national healthcare system. Yes. And um, what are your what are your greatest um, fears? Um, one young man said he got into Temple and talked on because he was a he. I mean, I asked him, "Don't your student loan? Why you could have applied for?" He said, no, I would have, when, I, when I'm finished, I would have 40 plus interest, 40,000 plus interest. One of the young men said, um, uh, because uh, he had to look after his five or six other young um, children. And these are things that you can relate to because with, you, you, you had an experience where you've seen all of that and you've experienced it, you've seen all of that happening in society. where vulnerable and marginal people, marginal groups in society are struggling too. But what are your fears as you think about this new thrust 
of yours and this endeavor? What are your fears and fears for, for the future, fears for the present? And, um, and the second, this is a two-part question. Then how do you plan to, um, um, to get over them? Okay, I, I missed the first part because... Uh, oh, sorry. What are your fears um, as you think about uh, the future and this new thrust that you're embarking on? What are your fears in life? Oh, yes, yes. Um, you know, my fears is, is uh, you know, based in history, which is that, uh, you know, there's that old saying, um, don't kill the messenger. You know, everybody yeah. knows that saying, right? Well, it's a saying for a reason. <laughs> it's yes. that all throughout history, messengers have been killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're trying to bring a message. We're, we're, we're trying to say something positive, something good. Um, and unfortunately, some people just don't like being told that. And, uh, and so that's always a concern, you know, right. uh, it, but especially in this hyper politicized environment, you know, we, we saw things happening like where, you know, the Trump uh, supporters were trying to run a, a Biden bus off the road. Um, you yes, know, yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we we saw all this ridiculousness, right? You mm -hmm. know, this, this um, radicalization of, uh, yes. of, of you know one side in particular, but you know, it, 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 both sides are becoming hyper politicized and pulled apart. You know, you know, to both extreme ends. But this also roots back to gerrymandering. You know, it's the Supreme Court has not had the political spine, you know, to to do something about it. You know, and and yes. to put an end to gerrymandering, try to create a formula. Uh, they'd rather just do this hands-off approach um, and, and watch our republic erode from, from within. And um, so, you know, I, I have my fears, you know, and I have my concerns about, about doing this, um, about yeah. making it. A, a, I mean, the central part of my candidacy is that I'm going to be suing Trump in New Hampshire. Right. In the primary, you know, and, um, well, and, and I saw, and I was, I'm so happy you brought that up. That's kind of what I wanted to ask yeah. you about. And, um, yeah, yeah, only, and I mean, and uh, you said that only certain people have that authority to do so, and so on and so forth. But yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, unfortunately, the courts have have uh, uh, elaborated on this term called standing. You know, where you have to have a direct injury, and a voter doesn't have a direct in injury. I disagree with that. Just out there for, for all the viewers, um, I, I think that every single American would be uh, have a direct injury if somebody disqualified was running. But unfortunately, the courts have not held that, and. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, once it goes to the general election, they view it as what's called a political question, which is their way of saying, we're not gonna resolve that. So yes. the, the conclusion based on all my legal research is that it would have to be a fellow Republican presidential primary candidate that brings this suit against Trump to allow the federal judiciary the opportunity to determine uh, the extent to which section three of the 14th Amendment anti-insurrection disqualification clause applies to Trump. Yes. And I fully intend on doing that. And as you can imagine, with some of uh, you know his fanatical supporters uh, and some, and of you know, so for those of us who didn't understand what you repeat that again, you full intend on doing what? Oh, I fully intend on suing uh, Donald Trump in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. The reason why yes. it's New Hampshire is because that's the first Republican primary in the country, okay. and so uh, the filing for that would open, I believe, the second Tuesday of uh, of November twenty twenty three, so next year. Yes, 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 and. Uh, I would have to wait. I mean, I'm going to be there like the morning it opens, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we'd have to wait until Trump files, and then we're both candidates. Yes. And then, literally at that moment, we're going to just electronically file the the federal complaint. Yes. And so, at that point, it kicks off the litigation, you know, between right. you know Donald Castro versus Donald John Trump, uh, yes. and it would be the question of whether he's disqualified under Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment, which says any person that has given aid or comfort or uh, participate in any way in an insurrection is ineligible to hold public office. And right. so we'll see at that point if the federal judiciary has the time and yes. guts to bring on this issue and to make a declaration. Uh, right. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, the fact that everybody's already rallying behind DeSantis in Florida is evidence that they think Trump is going down in flames. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, right. Yeah. Uh, yes. But yeah, that's, that's a big part of my, uh, uh my, my candidacy, but because I view him as poison and toxic. And so a lot of people yes. are like, you know, oh, but you're about bipartisanship, bringing everybody together. So why are you trying to uh, have yes. Trump qualified? Um, and it's just like, look, <laughs> you, you can't have toxic poison in, in the mixture when you're right. trying to yes. bring people together uh, because there, there's an active element that is trying to prevent that. And you yes. have to neutralize that first. 
once we neutralize right. that, then we can bring everybody together. And so, um, you know, but unfortunately, you know, I understand where you're coming from here. Sorry to cut. Here is it that you, you, you know, you're about bipartisanship. You believe that you are against extremism because you believe that that's against progress. And it will be hypocritical to what you're about if you don't. And some of these, these, there is a process to this. You know, at the same time, you have to also root out the toxic while at the same time, and while at the same time, think about moving forward from that. But it begins with things like these. And you believe that Mr. Trump is part of the toxic and you believe he bears any responsibility for what happened in January 6th? Oh, yeah. I mean, based on, so I've reviewed a lot of the evidence from the January yeah. 6th committee. And I think when they finally put this all together into, um, it's going to be a book like the 9-11 Commission Report. Um, yes. I think it's going to be very clear that this was orchestrated starting two days after the election. Yes, and yes, it had yes. to do with the fact that um, they immediately, um, they were immediately replacing people in the Pentagon. They yes. were putting people in key positions. Uh, they were changing the authority over uh, who could uh, activate the National Guard. Uh, yes. They were um, immediately promoted Michael Flynn's brother, gave him an extra right. star, and then put him in the right department they would oversee have direct power over yes. uh, the National Guard and other elements of uh, protection in Washington, D.C. Uh, they, there, there is no doubt. A, a lot of people just don't know this yet because it hasn't been revealed yet. Yes. They were actively trying to overthrow the American Republic. They were going to overthrow it. That was their, that was their goal. Yes. They only decided to back down when they saw that things weren't going as planned. The plan was to zip tie members, hold them hostage, get yes. the rest to flee, and then at that point, make a declaration of a new republic. They were literally going to overthrow the entire federal government. Yes, and just yes, people yes. just, they think that uh, people like me and others are being hysterical. And it's just because they haven't seen the evidence yet. But I think once the evidence is revealed, they're going to see how close the American experiment came to yes. completely collapsing. Collapsing. Oh, well, thank you so much. And, um, and uh, what are your, what, uh, and I, might, I may have asked you these questions already. But um, who, where do you draw your greatest inspiration from? And um, I haven't asked you about you. And do you have siblings? And um, tell me, and um, do you have a family? And, what's, and how, how do they inspire you? So this question is probably several prong. But um, where do you get your inspiration? What drives you when you get up in the morning? What makes you tick and so on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I draw my inspiration from a lot of sources. Uh, yes. you know, our founding fathers, you know, uh, you know, Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine. Um, you know, I know most people don't view Thomas Paine as a founding father. I do, um, because it was his writings that that you know led to to the free thinking movement. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, JFK, um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, a lot of people. A lot of people. Yes. I mean, again, I think again, everybody. You know, because you ask a Republican who are your greatest heroes, right? They'll always say Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> um, and Ronald Reagan, right? Like the reason. Yes. Um, and to me, it's, no, it's, it's, it's both sides. It's all sides. It's, it's, it's everybody, you know? Um, in, in more of the social realm, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, um, you know, again, it's, it's very, you know, focusing on, on the peaceful part, you know, that you, you, you yes. can make change. There are a lot of people that don't believe you can't make change except through violent means, right? Like the only real yes. power comes from the barrel of a gun. You know, that's a very popular saying. Um, yes. But I, I don't agree with that, you know, and that's what politics is about. Politics is about influencing people. You know, it's, it's about talking to them, explaining your side of the story and getting yeah. them to slowly agree. They might not fully agree, but at least if you can get them to at least see where you're coming from, that in and of itself is powerful because now you've made that person more well-rounded. Um, and at least they can intellectually disagree with you, fully yeah. understanding your side of, uh, of the story as well. Um, but it will get them to, to slightly change their position as well, having newfound knowledge and understanding. Yes. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. From a lot of different sources, you know, growing up, um, you know, my brother was a big influence on me and yes. um, he was the one that introduced me to politics. And, um, uh, and your brother is older than you, younger? Uh, my brother's older than me by four years. And, um, you know, when I was in, uh, in high school, he introduced me to the anti-globalization movement you know, against the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and the International yeah. Monetary Fund, um, you know, the Battle of Seattle in 1999 and all of that. And so that was sort of my introduction into, uh, you know, our rigged corporate economy. Uh, and I've written about that, 
all of what you have just said, every single issue that you have spoken about is in my book, Neoliberalism. I've done research about oh, nice. that. Because the world, people don't understand the World Trade Organization, the IMF, and especially if you are from the global south or you have any kind of affiliation with the global south. And by that, when I talk about the global south, I'm talking about yeah, yeah. developing countries or so on. Um, you know, many they, they have experience with the IMF and so on and so forth. So I can understand what I can understand what you're saying here. But you but and continue with that. Continue. I apologize for continue. It's, it's, no, 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 no. So uh, that so because I, yes, yeah, yeah. So so that was my introduction into into global politics and then understanding oh. how our rigged corporate economy works. Yes, um, yes, yes. And then you know what to kind of do about it. You know because right, so. again, uh, you know they they always try to paint it as a. Uh, a false, um, a false uh, equalization, I, I guess. Like um, yeah. I, I forgot what the, what the term is, but basic false equivalence. That's it. Yes. Um, because they say, oh, if you're against our, our current economy, then you're anti-capitalist, right? You're socialist, you're communist, and it's just like, no, no, I'm not. Um, I believe yes. in free market capitalism, and what we have right now in the United States is not free market capitalism. It's rigged corporatism. There's a difference. Um, if we had free yes. market capitalism, you'd, you'd have entrepreneurs. Uh, being able to start up very easily, uh, you'd have a ton of, and you've had, you'd have a very robust uh, small business economy, right? Think of the 1960s. You know, we had more wealth, we had a robust middle class because a lot of businesses were locally owned, the local pharmacy, uh, you know, the local butcher, all of that, and now that's all been replaced with Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, and so yes. you know that means that when you spend money in your local community, it goes out, it goes out to 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 Wall Street investors in New York. And so, um, so again, you know, that's, that's what I always tell people because, you know, once I, once I start talking about labor unions and living wages, it's rare to think like, oh, you're a socialist. It's just like, yes, no, it's that is true. It's that is true. Liberty and, and the freedom of contract. Um, and, and then I tell them, if you really want to get into what capitalism. But you're about protecting capitalism. Mm -hmm. You're about, in, in other words, so you're saying that capitalism, the capitalism that we have now is not the capitalism that we have them, the one that promotes um, individualism and fairness and free competition and so on and so forth. So you're saying that by promoting some of these unions and having stronger involvement in government and so on, this is important. Yeah. So, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Capitalism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I felt like we, it was really good in the sixties, you know, yes. uh, but then, you know, all throughout the seventies, especially the eighties um, yes. and nineties and two thousands, you had this consolidation of corporate power. Um, yes. And I know that, look, naturally in, in a, a capitalist economy, you're going to have corporations emerge, right? Because they provide right. us a better product, a better service. Um, yes. But then again, like I mentioned before, you get into that uncompetitive behavior where you start sabotaging uh, your competitors. You start uh, abusing the lobbying process yes. to create uh, new illegal barriers to new entrants. Um, you know, and, and again, it's, it's uh, me having later in life studied at Harvard Business School and starting to understand how they do and manipulate the system later that uh, I started understanding like, oh, okay, so that's how they got to the position that they're at now. And so yeah. the question is, how do we resolve it now? Well, that's, we have the laws on the books, the, the anti-monopoly laws. We're yes. just not enforcing them because every time we think about enforcing them against Google or Facebook or AT&T or any of these corporate Goliaths, they start pumping millions of dollars in federal lobby. And they buy out state legislatures. They bought out the entire U.S. Congress already. And yes. so, uh, so yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, but like I said, my background, my knowledge, and my understanding, I know how to approach this. I know what needs to be done to actually fix the system. Um, yeah. And it would be in a way where we could definitely get bipartisan support uh, to rally behind it. Great. And um, finally, um, you just said something about companies being bought out and so on and so forth. One young man said to me, ask, ask, ask John Cash will for me, please. I'm like, what, what is it? What is it? He said, I ask him, I hope, what are his plans before he gets contaminated by the system? <laughs> no. And this is a fair question. I mean, yeah. he said that a lot of people have great intentions and pure, pure intentions and then, then they get into office. I know I, I need to make, a lot of people have pure intentions and so on. Yeah. They get yeah, power, power corrupts and absolute power yes. corrupts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, and then, I mean, the, the lobbying, the lobbying system in Washington, DC was specifically created um, to give the power elite control. Right. I mean, it's right. like 
uh, I, I don't want to get too far off topic and, and I want to yes. focus on staying pure, but um, like yes. here in Texas, for example, a lot of people are surprised to find out that all of our judges are elected. Even our Supreme yes. Court judges are elected. And so people ask why? Well, you have to go back to the founding of the Republic. The landowners, which were the aristocracy at that time, uh, yes. the elites, the status quo, they did not like the idea of an independent judiciary. So what did they do? They made judges electable. Why? Yeah. Well, because through elections and bankrolling their campaigns, you can effectively control the judges. And so think of the, the, the same concept applies to the lobbying system. Why was the lobbying system created to begin with? It legalizes bribery. Well, it was created because the elite wanted, was they were afraid of people in Washington, D.C. being too independent. Um, yes. So they wanted to have a way to corrupt them and to erode their independence with time. And I knew this from the get-go, which is yes. why my first, uh, both my campaigns for Senate, which Senate was more of a PR stunt, I'll be honest. The congressional race, though, was more serious. You know, I spent uh, over half a million dollars of my own money, but I did not take a single dollar. And that's specific by design. I don't want to be corrupted. And that's me acknowledging that money is a corrupting influence. Right? Yes, yes, as, yes. as much as I say that I'm pure, it, it would become difficult, right? If somebody is, is giving me two, three million dollars through a super PAC for me to not answer that person's phone call or not to give that person special access or special preferential treatment. And that is why I decided from the get go, I need to focus on my business bona fides first, build a successful company, sell it for everything it's worth, and then use that wealth that I generate to run an entirely independent campaign. And so that is why uh, in this campaign, I, I, we, we wanna put a lot of money into New Hampshire to see how I perform. But yes. it's, and it's all going to be contingent on New Hampshire to see how we, how, if we can get at least the top three, um, yes. I might consider, I think either way, we're going to go all the way to the convention and, and right. uh, I can get into strategy later. But uh, I think that I'm running now. I definitely want to win. We want yes. to see how we're going to do in New Hampshire, yes. but I'm still young and I'm 38 right. years old and I fully enjoy 38. Oh, you know, I, I said, I told him that you were 44, but you are 38. <laughs> okay, I'm 38. I'm 38. Younger than and, me. Uh, You're younger than me. Yes. Yeah. But I'm, I'm definitely not, this is not the first time, uh, and first and last time I'm running. I'm, I'm right, running. That's true. Um, and I think this, uh, this may become a thing for me. You know, I, I'm going yes. to keep running until the American people feel fit to select me to lead the nation. And what's different about this time than the last time? Um, well, you mean the congressional run? Yes, that yes. Um, I mean, no, no because you ran already, so and you're running again. So, so what is yeah. any what's any what's new about it and new about you? Oh, and, what's new? Yes. So, I mean, as as we've been putting together the strategy, and, and we've already yeah. had people volunteer uh, come up as volunteers in New Hampshire, Iowa, um, California, Florida, New Mexico, Nevada. I mean, we, we have people all over the place. Um, yes. I'm putting together the campaign infrastructure. And that's why some people are asking like, oh, is this a serious run? <laughs> I would not be spending, I, I'm a very busy man. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not only building a company, but I'm also setting the ground. And this is the reason why I'm starting so early. Is yes. that I'm, I, I know I'm not gonna get any party support, right? From the Republican National Committee. So I'm gonna have to do all this on my own. Yes. Um, but I'm already putting together the campaign infrastructure to, to make this possible. But I'm also letting my campaign volunteers know this isn't a one-off presidential campaign. Um, yes. I hope we get lucky. And, and that we can come out on top in New Hampshire and, and that might drive the momentum and there might be a sudden like Obama type surprise, you know, where. Yes. Know, yes. I know what, um, but I do also acknowledge that the likelihood of that is, is very low. So I'm letting all of our volunteers know that I'm in this for the next 16, 24 years. There's yes. going to be multiple presidential campaigns um, until again, we can convince the American people that our ideas are solid, that we can actually get stuff done. And when we start getting away from this divisiveness and start coming together again as a yeah. country, they're going to be looking to leaders that were the leaders of that bipartisan movement that helped achieve that. And that's where we feel that we can then emerge and then run a very successful presidential campaign and then hopefully be in charge of, of yeah. leading the free world. And um, I know I'm going to ask you, like, if people want to get involved in your campaign, where they can go to, but I hope I don't forget that question, because I want to ask you about community development, which is probably the last two questions. Community development, a lot of people in communities, they're saying that as much as we have, we talk about stimulus and so on and so forth, but com communities 
It's as if the, the investments, the financing, the funding, it's not reaching the community, the community level. And people are not, you know, I hear Shaquille O'Neal say that, oh, they're setting up a mama papa fund, but it's still not reaching. There's so much talent in communities. And I, and I do research as well, anthropological studies. I go into communities. I, I go into cities. I do comparative study. In, I go into communities and I ask hundreds of questions. That's, I, I get involved in the community when, to see what's going on. And it's not reaching them. So many talent and so on, you know, is there any plans that you have in terms of access and reach and just get really connecting in terms of business and community development and so on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's like what you said, um, you know, the difference between you and I and others is that we roll up our sleeves and we go out there. You know, yeah. I didn't uh, hire a bunch of people to try to do an organizing for me when I was in college. I went out and I did it myself. I started knocking yes. on doors, um, meeting with sanitation workers for the, for the city and convincing them to sign a union card. Uh, yeah. You know, I went knocking door to door on, uh, you know, uh, fast food restaurants and trying to get them to sign up for the Service Employees International Union. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but a lot of other people don't do that. They don't, they don't do that, you know, um, where the metal meets the meat, boots on the ground, you know, roll yes. up your hands and, and get your own hands dirty. And, and I think that's unfortunately what a lot of people don't do. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, that means that a lot of money just ends up getting wasted on the uh, inefficient uh, administration of those funds. And, uh, and then they don't actually end up hitting the community. The difference between, again, me and others is that uh, I would actually go out into the communities. I would actually yes. want to see, like do like a boots on the ground inspection. And, yes. um, and unfortunately, that's, that's, that's the only way that it can be done. It, it, it requires a lot more literal legwork. But uh, yes. But if you want to see your vision come to fruition, you have to be willing to put in the energy. And that's what I've generally found in politics. There's a lot of passion, but there's not enough actual boots on the ground energy being done. Yeah, so you're not about talk, you're about action and getting things done. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you have to have a good plan, right? So you don't want to yes. get up in there without a plan. Um, but it, it's, it's this, again, balance. You know, I, I've, I've found that there a lot of leaders out there that are too obsessed with precision. They want everything to be, to be accurate before they pull the trigger. But then a lot of times that obsession with precision can lead to inaction. But yeah. then there's entrepreneurs like me, right? That we just like sometimes roll, roll the dice, yeah. shoot first, ask questions later. And then that's <laughs> kind of reckless, you know? Yes. Uh, so that's, that's this extreme end. And so what I've generally found, um, you know, being in both politics and business is to find that, that middle ground, um, you know, where, where you can, do the planning, but also you have to have a, a clear red line that by this date, we're pulling the trigger. So do the best you can planning, but then you eventually have to execute. And again, you have to actually be boots on the ground and inspecting these communities and making sure that the funding is actually reaching them. Um, yes. And so, uh, so yeah, again, having, having personally experienced that, uh, you know, yes. I think it, yeah, it puts me in a really good position to, uh, to, and a lot of people don't like this, you know, uh, micromanaging, you know, they view micromanaging as a bad thing in the business yeah. world. It can be a bad thing sometimes. Um, but I think in government as, especially as an executive being, you know, the executive of the executive branch, you have to micromanage, you have to make yes. sure that, you know, your agencies are doing what they're told because, yes. you know, these agencies have, have, uh, employees that do not agree with your political views. Right, and right. Uh, this is what is, is sometimes referred to as bureaucratic resistance. You know, uh, right. Biden is experiencing this right now with Trump holdovers, um, yeah. you know, and, uh, and Obama experienced it with some of the Bush holdovers. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll always have the bureaucracy. And, and these are just ordinary people that don't agree with your political views. And you're trying to implement yeah. a policy and they're going to do everything they can to derail it. And so, again, you know, as an executive, you need to be at those departments. You need to be in those communities. And making sure that your policies are actually being effectuated, and yes. um, and it's also that understanding and that knowledge that I would bring to the table of being able to uh, to make sure that uh, you know nobody's screwing with our agenda. Yes, yes. Oh, great! Thank you so much. And guys, for those of us who are just joining us, we're here with uh, the 2024 presidential candidate, John Anthony Castro. It is refreshing. A young man who is very experienced, who has tremendous hope and dreams. And um, coming up from a grassroots organization, and he's taking the world on by storm. 
so much vision, so much passion, so much hope, so many ideas, man. <laughs> um, and how can people get involved in your campaign and what and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, just go to johncaster.com um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm really big on, on Twitter right now. So, yes. you know, I, I would invite people to Twitter. I know everybody's really upset right now with Elon Musk taking over. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> but I, I just say, look, you know, you're not going to win over people by staying in an, an echo chamber. And if anything good is going to come out of Elon Musk, uh, it's going to be that he forces everybody into a room together. And yes, yeah. some of us dislike each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody can tell me they dislike Trump more than me. I'm literally making my entire campaign about suing him. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, so yes, uh, you know, don't nobody can ever accuse me of liking Trump, but yes, I don't, I don't mind if he comes back on Twitter. Yeah, he's going to use it to try to race bait. He's going to use it to try to subvert democracy. Yes, we're smarter, we're stronger. Uh-huh. Let's confront yes. them. Let yes. let them come to us. Let's engage yes. them. Let's talk with them, and not to troll them, but to again to try to educate them, try to illuminate right. them, um, and and enlighten them. And yes. I, I'm not afraid to to back down from a fierce debate. But I've generally found that that social media has done that to a lot of people. They're afraid yes. to others that oppose their views. And uh, and again, I, I think that that's one good thing that could come of it, which is that it could yes. actually help bring us back together again, force us to talk to each other. And right. uh, and yeah, hopefully things will get better. Thank you so much. And you have the last word. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to anybody here, to the, to the audience and just the people that you seek to become a great leader in this country? Yeah, just, you know, don't get discouraged with short-term losses. You know, when when, uh, Trump got elected, you know, I know a lot of people uh, felt really demoralized, wondered where this country was headed. Um, But I also feel that it was a lot of complacency. You know, they elected Obama and then everybody just felt like, oh, okay, I can go home now. No, you can't go home. (laughs) Yes, yes, Um, yes. You know, it's, you you need to continue pushing. It's, it's It's a never ending struggle. And you need to constantly stay engaged. You need to constantly stay involved. You need to be in it, be in it for the long run, right? Like, yes. I'm not going to, if I if I lose in 2024, I'm not going to get discouraged and, and hide right. or rock. You know, I'm going to come back again in 2028, yes. 2032, yes. in 2036, and 24. I'm going to keep coming and coming and coming yes. until yes. I die. <laughs> and yes. so, yes. you know, you have to, you have to understand uh, and have that long-term strategy. Because if not, you're going to get very quickly exhausted very quickly demoralized and you're going mm-hmm. to retract from politics, yes. right? Because you don't see that immediate gratification, that immediate short-term win. Um, so I would just say that, you know, you got to take the losses with the wins yes. and it'll make the wins uh, uh, much better when you get them. Yes. Thank you so much. I am, I'm inspired by you. I'm touched. I'm a young man that's trying to build an organization as well and a personal brand. It hasn't been easy, but, um, but I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by what you have said. And, um, and, uh, and I, I'm wishing you all the best. And guess what? I know that we will find other opportunities to connect, I hope. And that, and I, of course, and I will invite you to come back on the show and um, as we grow and as we get better and bigger. And um, for those of us who, are, who listen to the show, thank you so much. This is the Neoliberal Corporation, serving the world today to solve tomorrow's challenges. And, and you can reach us at https forward, um, colon forward slash forward slash the neoliberal.com or RonaldoCMcKenzie.com. And you can support us at HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash anchor.fm slash the near liberal slash support. Thank you so much. And you will be able to view um, clips of this podcast as well in um, probably on our YouTube channels, on various feeds, and, um, and of course on various channels and podcast streams. Thank you so much and have a great day. All right, so that is it for those who are listening by podcast. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having and me. Yes, man. And I hope you do come again and um, do, and I will send a copy of it. I'm going to edit it and listen to it and listen to it and edit it and I'll send you a copy of it as well. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, man. Yeah. And I hope we get, to, we get to connect in real life. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'll let you know yes. next time I'm in DC, maybe we can uh, grab lunch. Yeah, man, yeah, man. And I believe that you are going to do well. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.